You're listening to Trek FM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we look forward to seeing you there. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan, and you're listening to the 602 Club. There was a little bar in Mill Valley where all the Starfleet trainees used to go. The 602 Club. You know it. <laughs> I was there more times than I can remember. Hello and welcome everybody from the uh, planet of Cubert. I'm so excited to be here tonight as we dive into something I'm really excited to be a part of um, with uh, two people that I really respect. So I'm, I'm just really glad to be here tonight. Um, I'm really proud to welcome back to the 602 Club to talk about Ready Player One, the book, Christy Morris. Hello. I'm the Fliberty Gibbet today. Well, <laughs> oh, you're flippity gibbet. Ah, excellent. Excellent. Well, it's great to have you here. So I couldn't decide if we were on, you know, Qbert or Dig or Pac-Man. Dug. Pac-Man. It was a hard choice. Yeah, Pac-Man. So, um, but um, no, I'm glad you're here. You know, everybody knows you from um, the Bond episodes. And of course, we talked about uh, the uh, Stranger Things, which, you know, full of 80s references. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think it's only appropriate that we have you here to talk about a book that is... Well, it's overflowing with 80s references. Yep, you get to hear me talk about D&D again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, one of one of the gentlemen that um, he needs no introduction, but I shall give him one anyway, hmm. the masterful, mesmerizing John Mills. <laughs> Both of those things are not true. That's great. We're already in virtual reality. Very cool. Thanks for having me back, Matt. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at your Oasis avatar. <laughs> oh, and, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. He, he has so much more hair. <laughs> he looks like a cross between <laughs> He-Man and Batman. <laughs> So ah yes yes <laughs> I love the uh, the bat cow with the massive uncovered musculature that you uh, have there you know, just it's yeah, <laughs> you gotta really show nice. it off if you program it. <laughs> you know flaunt it if it got it whether it's virtual or not yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, before we dive into this uh, well a uh, world renowned book um, remember that you can find us all over the place uh, Trek FM you can find us on iTunes and iTunes.com slash Trek FM. That's the best place to find all of the different shows here we do on the network. And of course, while you're over there uh, checking out and subscribing to the 602 Club, make sure that you hit us up with a star rating or review and let everybody know uh, what you think of the show. And of course, by that star rating review, let other people find us. So, Find us on Twitter at Trek FM or on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Trek FM. There's the listeners only discussion group on Facebook called the Babel Conference. You can find that by typing Babel into the search field on Facebook, or you can go to our website at Trek.fm and any of the show pages, you'll see a little discussion uh, button there. Just click that and that would bring you over there. And while you're at the website, perusing all the different shows that we do here in the network you can also go to trek.fm slash contact choose a show choose the 602 club and that sends an email to me and anybody else who was on that week so maybe you have some thoughts about what we have to say about ready player one and uh or maybe you've got some ideas about the show or you just want to say hi which we'll definitely say hi back so um check out all of those places make sure you're following liking subscribing all the things that you should be doing uh, that way that you can keep up to date with everything going on in the 602 Club and here on Trek FM. But I wanted to ask both of you, um, you know, this is a book that has kind of become, um, it's like lodged in the cultural zeitgeist of geekdom now, Ready Player One. And it kind of has been ever since it came out. And so I wanted to ask both of you what your kind of starting positions were with the book. Is this something that uh, before we decided, you know, to do this that you'd already read? I mean, it came out in 2011. Or was this your first time? And then uh, kind of wondering what your uh, first impressions are. So, um, John, we'll start with you. Uh, When was the first time? that you read Ready Player One, and um, what were your 
first impressions of this book? Yeah, it was a few years ago. I was uh, working somewhere. Somebody was reading the book. Um, her name was Jennifer. She was a coworker, a uh, lovely woman, actually, w- wonderful to work with. But uh, she was reading the book and she said, you got to read this. This is this has you all over it. And I was like, uh, OK, all right, I'll give it a try. And so I downloaded it and I read it um, and I did. I had a reaction to it like everybody was caught up in it. Uh, it seemed that everybody was reading it. I mean, it, this is around, I don't know, early ish 2015. Um, so maybe I was late to the game, but it was new to me. Uh, and then I reread it for this discussion. I had slightly different reactions um, uh, from time to time. What was your first reaction, you know, um, since it, this one was slightly different and we'll kind of end up getting to, you know, unpack those as we move along. But uh, what your first read through, what did you end up thinking then? My first read through was that it was entertaining, but relied uh, so heavily on references that it took some of the enjoyment out of it for me because I, uh, I took it as sort of a shortcut around uh, more in-depth plotting or actual character development felt like it was sacrificed at the altar of hip 80s references, as it were. That was my first impression. So, Christy... Uh- Getting ready for the show, was this your first time to read Ready Player One or had you read it before? This was my first time reading this book. I actually... This is your first time? You've never been cow tipping before? (laughs) Uh, No, actually, I I didn't initially start it because of wanting to do the show. Uh, My husband told me he had read it before and that the movie was coming out. Um, and of course that, you know, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times the book is better than the movie. Um, he recommended reading the book first uh, in this situation at least. And my first impression was that I was blown away, um, because it felt like it had a lot of unexpected cliffhangers in the book. Um, especially, you know, the big one close to the end. We'll get to that later. Um, it really caught me. Um, and I, I get what you're saying, John, as far as the references really being heavy in this book. But I guess also, too, I, I'll give away my age. Since I was born in 87, um, this was like a nice reminder of my childhood. Um, because even though I was a little late in the 80s, I did play Pac Man and go to the arcade a lot. And I remember coin operated games and, you know, um, I actually have played Dungeons and Dragons and uh, World of Warcraft and stuff. So all of that together <laughs> really made it a book that made me happy in the end. Yeah, you know, um, it's funny, John. Uh, we didn't know each other then, I don't think. But um, I think we read Ready Player One similar time periods because I read it back in 2015 as well. And I think it's because I- it really had... I, I, I just want to jump in and say that I can't imagine that there was a time in my life that I didn't know you, man. So this <laughs> is very bizarre. Thanks, buddy. Um, yeah, it was strange to think that maybe we <laughs> didn't know each other then. Uh, but I think by that point, we had really, that book had really become something. It had become kind of a phenomenon. And so that's how I heard about it was just like, oh, it's Ready Player One. You know, it's this it's this cultural phenomenon, really. And so I decided, okay, well, I'll, I'll read it. I'll see what it's like. And, you know, I think that um, my first reaction to reading it was, and finishing it was, oh, this is good. I enjoy this. This is fun. You know, um, but I think I, I felt maybe somewhat similar to you that where it could have been something that had an even more kind of stinging rebuke to it um at the end of our culture and where our culture is kind of going um it it kind of soft pedals it at the end like it gives you half of it but then it doesn't give you all of it and so that for my first read through i was like oh that was i mean i enjoyed the book right uh and 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 i enjoyed the way that he wrapped it all together and i felt like it i mean to put all that together had to take even if you grew up in the 80s this book would have taken meticulous Mm -hmm. research and um and been a lot of work but i just to me i had wished okay i'm i I could see where if you had maybe kind of brought this more to the level of maybe a fahrenheit 451 uh 
where you're really trying to say something that um, leaves the reader with uh, a pondering, like, hmm, you know, you have to stop and really think to yourself after you finish it. And it and it kind of, um, to, <laughs> to make a reference to what you said, John, on uh, your show Great Shot Kid the other day about Spielberg, um, he, he pulls the punch at the end of this book, like in, instead of really landing the punch, which is kind of what I expected after kind of beating through it all. So that's kind of where my first reaction was. Yeah, I, if, if I can interject, I've come to refer to that pulling the punch thing as the Truman Show syndrome because I remember when the Truman Show came out and everybody was all, you know, they're, oh, this is great. And I, I enjoyed it well enough and I thought there were truly excellent parts of the Truman Show. But the thing that I walked out a, a little bit irked by was that that film had constructed an audience outside of the audience watching the film. And as a result, uh, I thought that it blunted the potential social commentary that I, I would have liked to see in there. And the thing is, you're both making me feel absolutely ancient <laughs> because I, I'm old enough that like, I, you know, the explanations of some of the references, I was like, yeah, 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 I was there. I was there. Just keep, keep, keep moving. Been there, keep moving. Saw I'm more suddenly games. realizing that, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm suddenly realizing that I, I probably would be Halliday's age. And I'm like, oh, crap. That's no fun. For me, you know, being born, and I'll give it away, in, in 79, you know, um, I, I get a lot of these references, but I also wasn't old enough to quite get all of them because I also did, I didn't grow up in a family that um, was as heavily into pop culture at the time. But, you know, like some of the text-based games and stuff, like my, my we had one of those old TI computers that had the cartridge games and the floppy disk games, and we my, my friends and I literally played those text-based games together where it's like we walk down the hall, you know, and then you you see a room, and then you have to talk about what, you know. So, like, I, I, even if I don't get the specific reference, like yeah. I totally understand what it is that they're talking about. So, in, it, in that way... It kind of makes it a lot of fun. So yeah, yeah. As as fun as the book is, I think it's something that kind of gets glossed over a lot. Uh, and I I really caught this my this second reading is how much desolation there is. Like this world that this book is set in seems awful. Like it's just absolutely awful place to live. And it was interesting to me because it, it's a it's a it's a type of dystopian story where it doesn't feel like the Hunger Games where it just feels like, oh, we, you know, we'd never do that, right? I mean, this one feels so much more in some ways like a Fahrenheit 451 where it's like, this doesn't seem all that implausible. And that's one of the things that I, I, I thought that if there's a real strength to the book, it is that, that the world that he creates outside the Oasis doesn't feel too dissimilar and that's actually um i would say it's one of the scariest parts of especially rereading it i was like this is even more applicable than it was you know a few years ago when i read it like some of the stuff is coming even more true um like when he was talking about the elections and how they happen and they really just turned into a popularity contest and all that stuff I was like Okay, well, uh, this is just getting, you know, um, nowadays we have, um, you know, talking poo avatars on your iPhone 10, you know, or what X or whatever they call it. Um, you know, I was like, oh, I, you know, the way that we're using technology and everything in this story, just, it seemed, I, I don't know, it, it seems blaringly uh, and glaringly scary to me. Even more so than before. Yeah, I completely agree with you in that aspect for sure, Matt. I think that the two things that really it creeped me out about that whole description of what the real world was like in that time were, one, um, how much time we spend with our technology and not with the real world, I think was a huge point of this book. And it related back to me, people I've known, even in my own family, that have played so much World of Warcraft that they don't leave their desk for like days. Like they have a refrigerator and a snack bar and a trash can and every now and then they get up to pee and that's all they need. Um, and then it also reminded me of how we are having an actual problem of too many people trying to live in the bigger cities altogether. 
and cities having to either grow upward or outward to make up for that issue. So it feels like, like you're saying, it's not far off to where we're going to be stacking trailers on top of each other. Talk about a trailer park. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I do agree that the, the world building of sort of this, uh, it's post-apocalyptic in the sense that it's the apocalypse is a believable one, that it's just certain problems got out of hand and, you know, economic problems on top of environmental problems uh, contributed to contributed to all of these things. But I think there there is an interesting question in terms of the oasis, uh, like a chicken and egg sort of thing. Like, did the oasis enable people to ignore the problem when they could still fix it as opposed to taking action uh, in the real world. I think that the matter of fact way that um, Wade, you know, sees the world, um, that it's not, it's almost like a Futurama esque sort of way where it's like, yeah, you know, this is just the way the world is uh, sort of thing. I think that that is probably something where I think that it, it didn't connect as well as it could have because I would have liked to see more of the main character uh, expressing more regret about the the state of the world as opposed to being matter of fact about it. I think that would have helped the resolution at the end to resonate more for the point that I think Klein does attempt to make uh, with the way that the book resolves. I like the the question... You know, because I feel like after rereading it specifically is is that the oasis becomes the drug for the hopeless and that it instead of, you know, uh, people working to make with a real better, they just work to make the matrix better. You know, this is a world where people willingly choose the matrix to live in because it's a better place to Mm -hmm. be. And it helps you forget about, you know, the, what's going on, it, it, you know, and, and and I think, John, in a lot of ways, I got the sense, especially in this reread, that it really, the Oasis, um, by the by the end of the book and the question, uh, you know, talking with Halliday and Morrow's perspectives put together, they both realized in a, in a lot of senses that the Oasis had um, hurt the world um, and that it had led to some of the the problems that we saw because people just stopped caring and just start living in this make-believe world where they could make it as beautiful and wonderful. And it felt almost real enough so they could forget that just outside their goggles, you know, it's a smog filled, you know, trailer park where you live 40 stories up, you know, stacked on top of each other. Um, And I thought that was really interesting because it also created this thing where, there's this com- the the oasis is all about this like veneration of the past uh as like the golden age and now i can live in the golden age because i can just be there you know like i can live in a world where the 80s actually exists vis- uh virtually um and i don't uh or or any i mean gosh you could i mean this they had tolkien world and like you know the the list would go on and on if i uh, john we could live in star wars world if we wanted to in the oasis you know and and be actual jedi um not that we're not now but that's a different story <laughs> uh so you know i i think that y- that question is fascinating but it 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 seems like to me that the world was bad and the oasis became the place that people couldn't resist turning to because, and it, and it did then compound the problem, and that's why you get something like um, the IOI, which is able to kind of take over with people not really realizing it's happening, the to where you have this one corporation kind of being the all powerful thing because you know nobody's really cared what's going on in the real world. They've really only been caring about you know what their you know Oasis house looks like. And, and if I can offer w- one thing to tack on top of that i think the thing that probably unnerves me the greatest and i don't know if this is the problem right is we can have this great discussion that's going on right now but part of the issue with the book for me was i didn't get a sense of intent so much 
w- with the eighties references conveying what I was left with, uh, especially this time, which is it's not even that these people are living their fantasy. And I think this addresses something that's in, you know, the online world and our obsessive pursuit of entertainment. They're living somebody else's fantasy. Mm-hmm. They're cost- they're, there's no expenditure of real imagination on the part of, of the characters except you know maybe in like oh I'll take this other thing that somebody else made and that's you know if Klein intends that to convey this sense of we've lost our creativity by relying too heavily on other people to be creative for us then that's a great commentary I'd love to sit down with them and be like you know was that on purpose yeah I mean it reminds me of that old Billy Joel song it's just a fantasy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not the real thing. You know, like <laughs> nice, it's exactly nice what the Oasis yeah. is. Like it is just a fantasy. And I think that kind of leads me to something, John, that I found that was really interesting, especially in this read, read this idea of uh, savior or slaver. And there is an interesting like juxtaposition between Halliday and Morrow, who both start the Oasis. Um, in the, I mean, they, they both are a part of the company that creates it. And yet they go separate ways because Morrow kind of has a revelation that it had become a self-imposed prison, he says, for humanity, a pleasant place for the world to hide from its problems while the human civilization slowly collapses, primarily due to neglect, and that gregarious simulation systems had actually helped foster that neglect. And... One of the things, though, that I was really struck with is that Halliday himself is someone that can't seem to overcome his own shortcomings as a person, and he ends up creating a new reality so he doesn't have to face reality. He can be Mm -hmm. Anorak Mm -hmm. and not have to really grow as a person because he can be who he wants to be and always hoped he would be virtually, but that doesn't actually challenge him personally in the it, to grow in the real world. And I thought that was interesting because in the end, too, it, it, it doesn't help other people in the story, um, like Shoto and Daido, uh, you know, two Japanese players uh, in the Oasis who embody that whole idea of, of reclusism, you know, um, and even Wade that we see, you know, and it just it feels like people are able to wear these masks and amuse themselves to death. Um, to quote Neil Postman, uh, mm. that they become enslaved to their own selfish desires, but it's not even just their own desires. It really, like, Halliday himself becomes the god of the Oasis. And mainly because everybody com- becomes obsessed with what he was obsessed with. So it's not that people are even, like you said, obsessed with what they love, and getting to create what they loved there in the Oasis, they're just obsessed with all the things he is. Like, I mean, the almanac literally becomes Wade's Bible. I mean, he worships at the altar of Holiday and all of these things. And so it was just so interesting that, to me, in the end, it's it's kind of created this sense of like meaningless existence because nothing is real and everything is based on a foundation of sand and you know what we have as our god in the oasis is is really something that's just a a person who is just as fallen and 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 has just as many shortcomings as we do Mm -hmm. like but everybody you know i they've lost the will to like to care about what they care about because they only care about what he cares about. Like it's, it's almost, I don't know. It's, it's a strange thing of this whole loss of identity. I feel like for a lot of people, because they all think they love all of this stuff. The reason they love it is because they've been told they should love it by holiday other than just like, I love it because you know, I watched it when I was five and it's like the thing that's my favorite, you know, even if other people still Mm -hmm. hate it, you know, like, I thought that was fascinating. And it really speaks to, to me, Halliday's ego even of I'm going to make everyone love what I love and then that's how they'll win the contest. You know, and and it's sad that it feels like it all became that, what you're saying, Matt, of it, everyone not even having 
um, the creativity to have their own stuff anymore. It's all about what Halliday was interested in. Um, and, and then I think, too, it really also could be even a commentary about greed in society now that everything really revolved around wanting to get his and, you know, his fortune. So they did all the research they had to do because they just wanted the money. Yeah, I, I mean, the the thing, uh, you know, what, one place where my brain goes is w- with the way that the society is organized in this where everybody's in the oasis and like physical contact you know Dido and Shoto aren't actual brothers and one of them you know freaked out when they actually met in person and all of that type or suggested it or whatever but like it, the, you know the one the one thing is like if you're worried about overpopulation it seems to me that this societal model would collapse uh, within a generation or two and you'd, you'd have a lot fewer people because they weren't having kids um but in terms of how it is set up as you know like this godhead i think that in and of itself can wind up functioning as uh, uh, a sort of the way that people have come to venerate and adore uh, celebrities and also you know artistic creators like it the tendency exists for people to become I will I will pull one out that nobody would expect me to use, but like Marvel fans, right? Marvel Cinematic Universe fans, they become very dedicated to that, and that and we use religious terms to uh, talk about the, uh, the the affirmed works that exist. And of course, it's, you know, hey, as a Star Wars fan, I have to turn that lens on myself as well. But like the use of the term canon and stuff like that, like we have elevated entertainment to a religious status uh in culture and it you know it's it's one of those things where i'm actually maybe my my opinion on my second read of the book is actually being rehabilitated by this conversation because of the fact that i'm you know these things are being teased out and i can't believe that an author would not have put this uh intentionally within the work so I, I think that that's something that, you know, throughout the book, it, it is interesting because there is this whole there's this whole thing because on the other side, you know, Morrow seeing the dangers of the Oasis, you know, he gets out of that business, you know, because he felt like they were ne- they were no longer in the video game business. You know, to become the way Oasis had become something horrible. So he and his wife create this uh, Halcedonia, this magical kingdom, which is it it kind of like as Wade describes it, it kind of almost feels like Mr. Rogers neighborhood uh, for kids. Right. That they they can go to. They can learn. They learn about, um, you know, math and science and, you know, all of these things that actually teach kids to be better. And um you know, they they uh, he also told said that you know it was something that helped his self esteem. Like it was it was a, a it was a program and a place that actually fostered his being in the real world, instead of being the thing that Halliday created, which was this piece of technology that only um, embodied the worst sense of self absorption. Like where it's all about you and what you look like. And I mean, it, you know, we talk about later in the book how, you know, uh, every Oasis person, if you have enough resources, you can have your own channel where people just follow you around in the Oasis and can watch your channel. Like where and, – and what I liked about this idea, like between these two, one is – a one – the 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 one that doesn't seem like it's the savior is actually the savior and that's morrow and the slaver ended up being halliday he enslaved an entire generation of people and more into his system that created this world that was totally self-absorbed and only about you and what you could get and and it it created this and and I loved the way the whole idea this is something that really bothers me, so I'm going to get on a soapbox for just a second. But I'm so tired of, of technology commercials talking about what they can do for me. Like, I'm tired of the fact that the new iPhone doesn't have anything to do with how great of it connects me to other people. It just makes my selfies look good. Mm-hmm. 
Like <laughs> we're turning our technology into this thing that feeds this selfish wolf. It's kind of that te- that Tomorrowland thing. And our technology is not actually helping us be better people or the, the world. It's just helping me be more me. Be but more self involved, I guess. In a world where I don't, you know, so it's like instead of going to the stars and taking care of the world we live in in the real, we're just trying to make ourselves feel better because we're seeing it crumble around us. And it's like I'm seeing the, the oasis happen here and the oasis doesn't even exist. It just happens to be in my pocket. Yeah, I, you know, the, it, it's interesting because that's that's an echo of uh, Interstellar. You know, uh, of yes, you know, we used yes, to look absolutely. up to the stars. Now we spend all our time looking down in the dirt. But I think also uh, with you talking about Morrow, one of the things that I think w- that winds up teasing out is something that irked me was, and we're going full spoiler territory, right? We're not oh, worried yes, about yes, that. At okay, this good. Point, I mean, we're thirty minutes mm-hmm. in, so okay, good. Uh, I'm just so used to having to ask the disclaimer, but with Morrow and Halliday's falling out that they go into. Where it's like it was basically it was over over a woman, right? I was so disappointed because what you're talking about, Matt, is there as a component. It would have been more believable and I think more dramatic and supported the resolution of the book more if Morrow had said we stopped talking because we finally had it out about the Oasis and I told him what a monster he had become. Yeah. And that serves as sort of like the turning point for Halliday where he's like, Oh my gosh, I I've got to do something to, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like that would have been more interesting to me. I'm glad you said that, John, because that's the way I kept feeling like I wanted it to go. Like when he finally gets to ask Maro at the end, what was the reason that you guys quit talking? You don't want him to say, oh, it was because we were both in love with the same girl. You feel like that's right. such a flimsy exactly. excuse. Well, and it's very yeah. cliched. Yeah. I mean, let's, I mean, that is kind of the super cliche of the two nerds who love the same girl and one's not, you know, uh, man enough to talk. And to I her. will say, I don't like, <laughs> if, even from a female perspective, the insinuation that just because someone is into the stuff I like, that the guys aren't going to get a girl ever. I think that's mean. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I got yeah. somebody. Your husband got exactly. somebody, Christy. And so. <laughs> and I can tell you, folks, if you've never seen Christy, you just need to follow her on Instagram, and you'll see how lucky Michael is. I'm just saying. Yeah, the UPS told so, me I was beautiful today, so that's how you know. Aw, see, there you go. <laughs> well, I, I, I do, I do think that you know, Christy, I'm, gl- I'm glad you mentioned that because it is such a tired, it's such a tired trope or whatever word you want to use for it, where it's like I'm good at technology and stuff, and I'm, I'm a social misfit. It's like, yeah. Yeah, okay, I guess. But like, it's a road we've been down so many times uh, with everything. And it's, see, the thing is, like, I. And now you just make me want to seem white snake because, you know, we're in the 80s, you know. (laughs) Here I go. But (laughs) I think that, I I think what's interesting is that um, I knew people like Halliday is described, right? Where they, they did have, you know, dysfunction around. Uh, you know, the opposite sex and stuff like that. But I I don't know that, I I don't know that we need to tread that in books or movies anymore. And it's like, I don't want to sound like somebody who's like, well, filmmakers shouldn't do this or that, but it's just, I don't know, maybe it speaks to our own collective lack of creativity that we're just regurgitating. I mean, you know, honestly, Ready Player One can act easily as a critique on where we find ourselves in the world of entertainment right now, where, you know, everything old is new again. Like I'm half expecting like a, a perfect strangers reboot to show up on Netflix any day now. And it's like, as long as they use Billy Joel as the theme song still, I'm okay with it. Yeah. No, they'll have a, uh, they'll have a a techno updated version. A really bad cover band (laughs) version of Billy Joel. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for God's sake, even full house has been brought back from the grave. What? But with what is no real Olsen, anymore? so Come it's on. not. I don't recognize it as a thing. <laughs> yeah, it's not actually it's, canon. Yeah. John. <laughs> yes, That's it's not, not canon. canon. <laughs> exactly. Oh <laughs> uh, no, I. You know, I, I think I like that that they're kind of pulling on that thread, though, because you know, between these two guys, um, I I do think that the thematic story elements between them 
aren't as strong as they could have been because, you know, when you get to the end, at the very end, when, you know, Wade wins the contest, spoiler mm-hmm. alert, if that's a spoiler <laughs> alert, because, um, you know, the character you start with is not going to be the winner at the end. Oh, um, no. The fact that, you know, he says that it's the real world, you know, and I, I think you understand that reality is real. And, there, you know, you get that and Wade's like, yeah, I think I do. You know, it, that would have been so much stronger if we had had some sense of that Halliday had realized that by the end, too. And what would have been maybe interesting is if the book had had more about Halliday in his early life or something, or just in life in general, like if we had been like following along maybe in the almanac or something, that there had been almanac chapters, you know, maybe John, maybe they needed interludes with uh, Halliday interludes so that we got an opportunity to kind of see more about him. So by the time you got to the end, it kind of made sense why he had done this and, and that, yeah, I mean, don't pull the punch. Have him say to Wade, I think you should hit the red button. Right. I think the oasis needs to die. Instead of just saying you know, it's there it if you need it. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And and that you are the only one who knows you can bring it back if you ever feel like the world can handle it. So I think it, that would have been much stronger. And it, it, it what, what it is also interesting because this whole thing, you know, we had uh, Holiday Morrow and then we have virtual versus reality. And I thought it was so interesting because – this is where I feel like the book really tries to have his cake and eat it too, and it just doesn't quite work for me because uh, in the relationships, things get really strange here because in the anonymous world, you can uh, Artemis even says to, to Wade, look, you only know what I show you, so you don't know if you really love me. And I thought it was really interesting because in their relationship too, when it, when it comes to like a romantic type of love – you automatically, you want to know that person in the real world. You want to see their picture because there is something you connect with, you think, but you also need and desire to know the this, this something you can hold, right? Like that's part of romantic love is is the, the mental and the physical. And, 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 that, and, and even your brain there in the oasis can't be fooled that – you know that that's not quite real. So you want to know the real person, and, and that's that. But then on the other side, you have like, uh, the, you know, our two Japanese characters, Shoto and Daito, and, you know, they see, consider themselves brothers, right? Um, you have H, who turns out to be Wade's best friend, but, you know, we find out she's actually a she, not a he, and she's African American. You're like, okay, so it's like it's it's trying to say that, yes, you can be everything you want to be and that all those relationships matter, but then at the same time, it's like, but not quite, and I, I, it felt so muddied by the end, I was kind of frustrated by that whole virtual versus reality, especially when it came to relationships. Yeah, I, I wonder if the book was trying to say that certain types of relationships can be purely virtual, other types of relationships can't, but then does that support in any way the you know supposed point at the end of like go out and live in the real world but if you're saying that some things can be virtual where it does you know like it it just i all that just to say that i I agree it gets a, a bit muddied at the end and i think i think that you know as we're discussing it we all keep coming back to the ending and i think that that is the linchpin because uh, i mean i guess it is for any book but like you go along and like I can I can take and accept, you know, this flaw or this strength and go through with it. And you're really counting on that ending to tie it all together. And I think that's where I think the reason we keep coming back to it is because that's where it needed to all knit together very neatly. And uh it didn't. And I I almost wonder like I'm intrigued to see the film because I want to see what changes they made. Because, for instance, and I, you know, I'll draw an example near and dear to your heart, Matt. Harry Potter and the Half Blood Prince didn't care for the ending of the book. There were certain things that were done. I was like, eh, this doesn't feel right. 
then I saw the movie and I was like, fixed it. You got it. That's right. Uh, and that's why we're we'll not going to talk about that then because you're so wrong. It's ridiculous. I'm just giving an example, Absolutely young man. Absolutely wrong. Just but it's giving cool. an example. It's cool. All right. There you go. <laughs> just de- no, I, I, I mean, I get what you're saying because I, I think that there are definitely, you know, when you talk about books and movies and all things, there are movies that I felt like are better than that. I remember, um, I remember The Help and I, I, and the book was good, but I felt like the movie was better. Um, and part of that was that I felt like the characterization in the movie brought to life some things in the book that fell a little flat to me, but the actors brought it to life in a way that made me feel it better. So, you know, I, I think that's, that makes total sense. So the other thing that, that kind of bothers me a little bit about the virtual versus reality is this thing where you can be whatever you want to be in the, in uh, obviously the, the oasis uh, you know obviously h is is a you know playing the character of of a white male because of the way people treat her um you know as a white male instead of an african american woman and all that but then it's also interesting because well in reality she's still black female and it's just, it was a, this weird thing. Like, again, it, it's like it's trying to say that you can be whatever you want to be, but at the same time, you can't really change who you are. I I don't know. It just, it, it was one of the places where I kind of felt like the story didn't quite think through every single thing that it's saying and how it kind of, like, undercuts maybe some of the messages it has because it doesn't quite line up to Yeah, me. it seems like he's trying to say you can only really know someone in real life outside of the Oasis, but then he goes back to saying, but you can think someone is like your brother even though you've only ever met online. And you're going, okay, which one do you believe? <laughs> I, I think that with H, I think what it is is there is um, you know, a definite racial uh, commentary on that, the, the way different races are treated and, you know, racism and, and, and stuff like that. But I think because of the way that it's done and the way that it's done is like a surprise reveal that's then just sort of moved past, I think it doesn't give it enough uh, attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that I think that's why we're all, you know, talking about it where it's like, eh, like I get what he was going for. I agree with what he's saying where it's like you don't treat different people of different races differently because – we're all people inside and it shouldn't matter what they look like, but she's had this experience where based on how she looks in the Oasis, she gets treated better. And so there's a definite commentary there, but just the way that it's handled is why it doesn't, it doesn't resonate the way that it should. Yeah. And I think that part of that is just that it's, again, it's kind of pulling the punch because it, it it feels like the book is 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 suffering a little bit under the weight of trying to be witty and and referency, you know, uh, and instead of maybe going for the jugular when it comes to some of these social commentary issues, where it really could have because you can have both, you can do both. I think um, you you don't have to undercut either one of those things, right? Uh, and you can, and I think the book would have only been stronger for it. In the point where it says that her mom developed her thinking that she had to be different in the game to be treated better, and then that her mom had a prejudice against her turning out to be a lesbian, uh, I thought was a good commentary in the sense that um, even her mother, who was who she thought would not have any prejudice because she had dealt with prejudice, had one. Um, and that, that everybody has faults, but that we need to try to be better. Um, but then they just glossed over that too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really great point. Um, so we've talked about the fact that there are all these references, you know, I, I, I kind of put, it's kind of death by nostalgia because it's, Hmm. you know, you can get lost in it. Um, and people did obviously in the Oasis as we've been discussing, but I just wondered what were some of your favorite references that they did use, uh, in the story that you're just, when you saw the one, you know, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Don, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, Tomb of Horrors is a quick and easy way to my heart because I I remember Dungeons and Dragons and I remember Gary Gygax and blah, 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 like all of this. Uh, it's Ravenloft and, uh, yeah. 
Um, but uh, I, I remember, you know, Tomb of Horrors. That was great. I love the fact that there was that reference. Um, I, I, uh, I. That's the one that I just go back to because I just thought that was the one that I found the most surprising of the references. I thought that where I where I had a little bit of trouble was that I found some of the references to be. Uh, I and this is going to sound weird, but they were too mainstream, uh, if that makes any sense. And what I mean by that is, is that Halliday was so, so geeky, so nerdy, such an encyclopedic knowledge of, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and, uh, you know, Lady Hawk and all of these sorts of things. I think the reason I fixate on Tomb of Horrors is because the other ones felt so much easier than that one. And I think that the circles Halliday would have been running in would have had he would have wound up building in references that were even harder to get. Um, but, you know, I get me. what you're saying. Like, it felt like Highlander and Blade Runner were a little too easy and surface level stuff that everybody's heard of rather than yeah. Tomb of Horrors. I didn't actually know was an actual thing. So I like that you brought that up. Um, I, I will say for me, I felt like the, the two things that stood out the most to me were... Um, the references to Dungeons and Dragons, not only things like that, but um, the quote from Artemis where she said, chaotic neutral sugar, um, because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you wouldn't yeah. understand that unless you've played a role playing game where you know that, you know, characters can be chaotic neutral or lawful good or, you know, whatever. Um, there's all these different classifications you can be. Um and, you know, even further into, like, you can have your mage and your fighter and your, you know, supporting people. Um, so I liked that. Um, and even making me think of when I played World of Warcraft, getting to dress your avatar mm -hmm. and all your different weapons and your bag of holding and stuff like that. Um, but I guess the one that really jumped out at me that made me so excited was later in the book when he just slowly eases you into he's galloping, but he's not on a horse. Oh, and I went, right. oh, my God, yes. it's the coconuts. Yeah. I was so excited because <laughs> yeah. I love, love yes. the Holy Grail. My dad and I joke about the rabbit all the time. Oh, yeah, that rabbit's dynamite. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's just a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> Big nasty fangs. <laughs> it's funny because um, I can't think of any one specific reference, honestly. You know, like there wasn't one that just, for me, just grabbed me. I, I think it was the culmination of most of them. And and then there were others, you know, like there's all of the um, uh, the obscure, uh, you know, anime type characters and robots and stuff. That oh, yeah. Did you like the kaiju? kind of fun. Yeah, you know, um, yeah. like, um, you know, and Voltron and all that stuff, you know, and, you know, that's, that's really, all that stuff is, is fun to me. Um, I was actually kind of disappointed that he didn't actually have to take the test. Did he had, he didn't have to go through the questioning. Oh yeah. From the uh, machine in Blade Runner. He didn't actually have to go through the questioning. Right. And I was going to, I was, I was really hoping that he would find a way to work that questioning in and make that mean something, but it would almost be like questions that had to do with something part of like how it is light or so. I don't know. Maybe just, Ernest was, Klein no, said, really I don't know what the questions would be. So I'm going to dodge that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's probably no, what it was. Yeah. But, but to, but to speak to that, what a great opportunity it would have been to teach any character going through that, who was paying attention about how people had lost their empathy because of playing the online games, mm -hmm. because that's the whole uh, underpinning yeah. question is human versus android what's the difference and are humans becoming like them and just as one last follow-up question to you christy in a world like the oasis since you have dungeons and dragons experience would it even be possible for somebody to be lawful good because there don't seem to be any laws right <laughs> so <laughs> if there are no laws i don't think how paladins can, can yeah no paladins in the oasis yeah everyone's guess, a rogue so <laughs> yes yeah that makes sense <laughs> Um, I wanted to just ask you quick, quickly just about the characters and what you thought of our main characters um, and if, if anybody really stood out to you that you really liked throughout the book and really kind of stuck with you or, or if you kind of felt like 
in the end that the characters just kind of are in a lot of ways the things the story needs to go forward. So I'm just kind of wondering where you land on on the characters. I feel like they weren't just there to move the story forward. I think they really did have a a place, um, but that they all did kind of revolve around Parzival still. Um, Because at the end of the day, it it really is a story of Halliday and Parzival um, more than anyone else. But I, I think that Artemis especially is a character you can really relate to um, and that does a lot for Parzival in changing his perception, especially, you know, I mean, at first he said, if I won the money, I would want to s- build an intergalactic space shuttle and get us off this planet while we still can, because clearly the earth's going down. We got to get out of here. And she said, you know, why wouldn't you want to use the money to try and rebuild what we already have? And I think that she's really got that opinion of we need to save what we have rather than just leave it to die yeah i uh i liked artemis as well um i also really liked h uh i i just thought that was a a a well-written character um and i think i i just really would have liked more done with h's real world story i guess um and i liked morrow i thought mar the only unfortunate thing about Morrow being is he was so obviously constructed as a, uh, I can't figure out how to get people out of this. So I got to have somebody who, you know, has godlike powers. So, uh, okay. You know, but like, I thought that he was, he was a fun character overall. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, it's, it's disappointing because I thought that the supporting characters were, um, more intriguing than Parzival. Um, yeah, that's where I end up. I no, I I agree with both of you completely. I I think the best character in the book is actually Artemis. I think uh, she's much more interesting, and it is it, it's fascinating to me that she kind of ends up being Wade's soul. Mm. Um, you know, she kind of reinvigorates him with a belief in that humanity needs each other. You know, she's kind of the first one who plants that as they've talked about, like you said, Christy, you know, what would you do if you won, you know? And, uh, you know, I think I wish that um, I wish that it felt a little bit more like Wade coming to that decision himself than just trying to do it to please a girl, because that's kind of what it feels like. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it is nice that you do get to the end of the story and they're outside and, you know, the last lines are, it's the first time in ages that he didn't think about going back to the Oasis, you know, like that real life was becoming more interesting than what, you know, you could do wherever you want because it's real life. And so, um... But in the end, I think that only happens because of Artemis, you know. And in the end, too, she isn't a manic pixie dream girl either. Like, she has her own motivations. Um, you know, she kind of tells him to, to, you know, F off for a while. And she doesn't even talk to him and all that stuff. And and um, because she's committed to, to doing what she thinks is best for the world which is hopefully her winning the game or at least one of the other Gunters winning the game. And so um, I, 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 I like that. I, I felt like they made her, it's like she's the only one I felt like is a fully rounded character next to Wade. Um, the rest of them do kind of feel like I wish there would have been more time to kind of delve into that. You know, I felt like, you know, the book could have been longer if we were getting some more interesting characterizations instead of just another reference. And if there's one failing with the book, I think that it it kind of, in a lot of ways, like a um, like a movie where it goes for the joke instead of you know something a little bit deeper, you know, like certain Marvel movies, <coughs> Thor Ragnarok. Um, you know, this <laughs> goes for the reference sometime when it could delve in a little bit more with some character detail or character story, like you said, John, with H, you know, and her her story. I think is you know. Christy, you mentioned, you know, everything we learn about her in the end, that happens all in the span of like two mm-hmm. pages and then we're done. You know, it's it's like it, it would have been nice if if we could have had more of that late earlier on. So um 
And there's this whole idea. I, so I wanted to ask you guys where you kind of come down in the end, not just ratings yet, but there's this kind of like bleakness and, and hope. Because the whole book, to me, I was struck by the bleakness of it. The world outside the oasis. But then, you know, as we kind of talked about, the kind of the bleakness inside the oasis. Because it is a world that is, or it's a, you know, virtual galaxy that is kind of run by Halliday's eccentricities. Not necessarily the creativity of everybody in it, per se. Um, and it, it, yeah, I, where do you guys come down to that? Cause I don't know if the end of the book is enough for me to feel like it's enough of a hope or enough of a win to not, because the idea of pulling, you know, the rest of the world out of the matrix with these two kids seems nigh impossible. You know, we saw how hard that was in the actual matrix, mm-hmm. right? Um, to get people to 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 leave, I mean, gosh, uh, what's his face? Cipher goes right back in because you know I know it's not real, but sure tastes real, so that's all I care about. Yeah, I uh, I think maybe what we're what we're at here is that uh, with this theme of the bleakness and hope is I think that this like I can finally put my finger on it is that the stakes throughout the book are world-changing stakes. But then the ending you get is a personal ending of hope, not a world-changing message of hope, not like the the end of like a Tron legacy or uh, Luke Skywalker blowing up the Death Star or something like that. You get something where Parzival's had a personal realization and the people around him, there's hope and happiness around there. But the whole book is, I guess, it, in a sense, unresolved because I didn't get a sense that the world was restored, that the hero had returned with a boon to benefit everybody, as it were. So I do agree with you there. Um, I will add, though, sort of 50-50 that I, I agree with you on 50% of it and then 50% of it, I feel like it was um, giving some hope in that um, Parzival calling all of the Gunters to help against the Sixers in that final battle in the game was humanity coming together. Because, I mean, they said it was like every Gunter in the game came to that battle. Um, So I, I sort of felt like that was a message saying that if there was a cause enough people believed in, they would do it in reality too. But, um, Mm. Parzival doesn't know any of those people other than the couple of people he just finally met in person for the first time. So it could take a lot longer. Um, yeah, but I, yeah. but I did feel like there were repeated messages of a light at the end of the tunnel. And so at the end of the book, I did end up feeling hopeful and positive because um, it, it seems like every time there is a bad situation, they escape it, you know, uh, he escapes his home life in, you know, the stacks of trailers and then he escapes being blown up by Sorrento because he happens to be hidden out in his little, you know, RV somewhere else. Um, then he intentionally gets captured by IOI and then figures out how to hack their system, which was incredible. And then, um, you know, all of them suddenly die and you think this is where the book is going to end. No way. <laughs> I I told Michael, I just suddenly stared at the page like, what do you mean they all died? <laughs> um, but then he gets his extra life because of that one quarter he found. And so it, all of that together ended up making me feel like there's always a way out. The, the thing that I think I came down to was that throughout the book and kind of the world view that the book has and that most of the people in the world seem to have at this moment didn't leave me hopeful because I I didn't feel as though there was a foundation to build on towards hope that would really bring about worldwide change in the way that you would need. I feel like it would be 15 minutes of everybody being like, oh, we need to get off the Oasis. And 15 minutes later, 
we're back in the oasis because <laughs> you, the, you know like um the the foundational worldview that we kind of have in the book doesn't really lend itself to making people want to truly be self-sacrificial this way to like give up something like this to put the world back to right that they should have been taking care of in the first place and i just i think that's for me where i i felt like the the personal end for for uh you know wade and samantha and the rest of them is beautiful right because they have come to kind of a self-realization that reality as painful as it is is better to be in because it's actually real mm -hmm. it means something it, it has stakes it has purpose and because it has true honest connection that that, that is not fake um you know we can hide each other things from each other in our in our, in our relationships from each other but it can't stay like that forever, you know? And if you really want to know somebody, it's going to take a risk and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it's good. But the, yeah, the overall overarching, because of what we set up with the world, I still found it to be pretty bleak. And I think rereading the book changed my opinion in that sense that by the end now, I definitely have a different opinion of it than I did the first time. And so I'm kind of wondering for, for both of you, uh, you know, where do you come down then on this book, Ready Player One, and what are your ratings? What do you think, Christy? I'm giving it a 9 out of 10, which may be unpopular, but um, it really... No, I mean, judging <laughs> by uh, uh, Goodreads, it's okay. pretty popular. It, it was popular enough to get a movie made out yeah. of it. I, I don't... <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you're alone here. I, I think that it, you know, the only drawback was that it was heavy on the references, uh, but otherwise, I mean, I was totally gripped by this story from the get go. Um, and it had so many things that I naturally already liked and was fond of and remember from my childhood. Um, so I think that that really did a lot for me in um, making me invested in the story. Um, and that, like I said, it, I still felt like even though it wasn't changing humanity as a whole, that it had a hopeful message at the end. Um, so it, I really enjoyed it. There was not much I didn't like. You're, you're not going to make me give a rating, are you? Every time I give a rating, I get in uh, trouble. Somebody gets uh, mad at me for ratings, Matt. This Every is, time. There's, there's no reason for anybody to get mad at you. It's your own personal thoughts. You know, <laughs> this is this is the opinion of John Mills. Uh, it is it is uh, you know whatever All they right. say at the end of things. It's it's his either views or his own or you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, his own opinion. Yeah. It has it does not reflect the views of the management or staff of the Six Hundred Two Club. <laughs> okay, good. I just all right, good. Um, I I wound up coming away with a much harsher opinion uh, this time around uh, than I did the first time. Uh, I would say, I mean, when I when I finished it this time, I was probably around the two out of five, whatever that translates to, is it four out of ten. Um, I would probably give it another nudge because this conversation has been so interesting and you know like I said earlier I can't believe that the author didn't intentionally want these discussions to be made um but uh yeah I, I wasn't I wasn't nuts about it this time uh, you know uh, yeah I, I think that you know my first time reading through this it was a four out of five right so eight out of ten um but yeah, for me, it's it's a three out of five now, and and part of that was because of what I kind of said at the very end. I I feel as though the the book and the views that it espouses to hold to don't leave me hopeful for the world in the end. Um, I like the I I like some of the messages, and again, I, like I you said, John, some of the conversations that we were able to have and pull out some of the ideas, and I think there are some very pointed things that, again, I just wish that Klein had been more inclined to be a little bit more um, forceful with the thematic elements that are here. And to be okay with slapping the reader across the face a little bit more to say, this is you, so get your S together. Or this world that I talked about could legitimately be the world that we live in in 2045. 
you know, it's not that far away. So um, I just wish that had happened. And if it had, I think I would have, um, the book would have been stronger and better for it. Um, and, and um, yeah, so um, I, I could go down a whole other road just about the, the kind of like philosophy and psychology and theology of the book. But that's the Cinema Stories podcast. So um, <laughs> I really appreciate, though, you guys joining me. I'm so glad we got to do this because it was a lot of fun. And I, I think, like John, I'm semi-interested to see the movie. But I don't know if it'll be a theater experience for me. Um, I, I think it may end up being something I see later on. Um, just because, I will be honest, the trailers haven't really done much for me. So... Um, but after rereading the book, I am kind of interested to see, it's always kind of interesting to see somebody take a book and make it into a film mm -hmm. and how well does that translate? So, um, do you, I uh, should ask you guys, uh, any, uh, plans to see, to actually see the movie? What about you, Christy? Uh, my husband and I are actually planning to go tomorrow just because we're so curious. So we'll let you know. Uh, if I can get to the theater, Yes. But that's always that's always a gamble because somebody's always got something going on at night, like yeah. Girl Scouts well, or I something. I mean, and I mean, I'm I'm even right now I'm the same way. My wife started a new job, and it's oh, congrats. Uh, we have a much different schedule than we've had recently, so it's yeah. So I don't know. Um, maybe we'll see. Um, but uh, thank you so much to Ken Tripp and Davis Grayson for supporting the show um, through Patreon. They're our associate producers here, and really appreciate that they have been so dedicated to the Six Hundred Two Club. And to the network here. Um, now, the the network that, of Trek FM is just a massive undertaking. Um, it's a bit like the Oasis. It's huge, and there's no way that we can do it without you. Um, so what we ask you to do is to go over to patreon.com slash trekfm, and that's a place where you can support this network coming to you each and every week. And like the Oasis under Wade, it's still ad-free. So um, <laughs> if you like that ad-free nature, then... Give a little bit a month to make sure that that keeps happening. Uh, we have lots of different contribution levels. We have some great perks that can come to you because of those contribution levels. But in the end, honestly, every little bit helps. So, again, that's patreon.com slash trekfm. Now, Dragon Master Christy, uh, if anybody would like to find you, um, where can they check you out i know you've got all sorts of different places that you are online so let everybody know where they can sure find you. i am no longer playing world of warcraft so you can't find my avatar i'm sorry <laughs> um but i am on twitter and instagram at bespin bell b-e-l-l-e -L -L -E, and i also um am on galactic fashion the podcast co-hosting with my friend Teresa delgado um and then of course i'm on the 602 club here um honored to be with matt talking about the james bond films yes yes we've got goldeneye coming up uh next so be on the lookout for that uh master john uh where can everybody find you if they want to check you out there online or uh, other podcasts that you're doing well when i'm not listening to the 602 club talk about james bond and vehemently disagreeing with their positive outlook on license <laughs> to kill you can find me online as kessel junkie of course you can also find me over on the Nerd Party Network, where I am co-hosting uh, Great Shot Kid with Mike Schindler and Aggressive Negotiations with you, Matt. And that's and of course I co-host Words with Nerds with my pal Craig. Well, and I just I love that you were so open about your wrongness about License <laughs> to Kill. It's it's great that you were uh, you were willing to share that on air. That's really brave of you, John. Um, uh, you, uh, you, you, you misspoke my rightness about License to Kill. I just want to know what you think of Moonraker. Oh, you should see our private messages back and forth about that. It's pretty funny. Uh, but you can find me on Twitter at MattRushing02. I'm on Instagram under the same name. Uh, you could find me here on the network doing The Orb with Chris Jones talking about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Uh, aggressive negotiations, and of course, Owl Post uh, with Drea Kaufman, where we talk all about Harry Potter one chapter at a time. That's over on the Nerd Party Network. And then I mentioned it, but if you would like to hear me and my good friend Courtney talk about films through the lens of faith, you can find that, and that's called Cinema Stories. And you can find all of the podcasts that every host here tonight is doing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, and I highly encourage you to check those out. But 
thank you so much for joining us. And y'all come back here.